I know that there are several other people supposed to be coming, um, but we're not going to wait. We're going to kick off. Um, my name is Steve Barnett. I'm um, uh, of, of, of this manner. Um, uh, I'm professional communications here. We have a very eminent panel to finish the day. Um, one of the things that uh, is going to emerge from the Leveson inquiry is a, uh, at some point, specific recommendations which Lord Justice Leveson will make for a uh, new or renewed system of press regulation. And here we have four people uh, who are either in the process of or who have submitted uh, actual models of how a reformed press regulation might work. Uh, in other words, formulated ideas. Um, to my knowledge, they might be the only four, certainly the four most advanced. Um, so uh, this is actually a good time, I think, to actually first hear about them and then perhaps uh, stress test them. So um, I'm going to introduce them. Um, I I'll do a, a little bit of biog first, and then I'll introduce them one by one. Uh, they'll each have seven or eight minutes to outline their plans. Um, I'm then going to uh, give them each a scenario and try and stress test um, their model against one particular scenario and see what emerges out of that. And then it's open to the floor. So um, Jonathan Collett, who's going to uh, kick off for us. Um, uh, I have to say, I've cobbled together a few biogs which I haven't run past them. This is on the basis of casual conversations and bits of Wikipedia. So uh, at some point, one of them might stop me and say, no, that's a load of lies. Um, uh, Jonathan uh, uh, had, had, went to University of Manchester um, and then became um, a campaign director of the Conservative Party's Bruges Group um, and was, it is alleged, very much involved in saving the pound. I don't know if that was your entry on Wikipedia, Jonathan. That's what it says. I didn't even know I had an entry on Wikipedia. Oh, there you are, you see. I don't know. Sorry, no. This was your profile in, in one of the, one of, one of the uh, magazines. That's right. So it wasn't, sorry, it wasn't Wikipedia. Um, then worked for um, Conservative Party leaders, for IDS, for Michael Howard. Uh, I think worked closely with David Cameron at one stage. Is that right? Yep. Uh, 2005 became public affairs manager at News International, 2007 director of communications at the Advertising Association, and then uh, 2009 um, was uh, persuaded, I think, by Lady Buscombe to go to the PCC as director of communications, and is now um, a sort of interim director. Is that a fair title? Um, I'm one of three people who comprise a senior management team. Okay. Obviously, we're in a transitional phase. Co-director co, co in a transitional phase. Yeah. Martin. Um, Martin Moore, on my left, um, uh, has actually had a, a, a very varied career, but it's very difficult to find it, actually, online. So somebody needs to put a, a, a Wikipedia entry in for him. But anyway, he, he uh, started, at, started at Cambridge, um, uh, then went to management consultancy in America for a few years, then went into TV production, Went back to academic work, uh, did a PhD uh, at LSE, uh, in, uh, and incidentally has written a book, I might as well give it a plug, The Origins of Modern Spin, 1945 to 1951. So Tony Blair could have done with reading that. Um, 2006 became director of the Media Standards Trust. Is that right, 2006? Mm -hmm. uh, now, it's interesting, because this is six years ago, and the MST was then set up to address mounting concerns about a decline in journalistic standards and lack of accountability. So we're talking about six years ago. And in 2009, um, came out with uh, what has turned out to be a prophetic um, report called a, F a Free and Accountable Press with Ideas for Reform. Uh, was um, dumped on ceremoniously by uh, the vast majority of working journalists at the time, some of whom, it has to be said, have now changed their minds. And last year, teamed up with Brian Cathcart, who was here, is Brian still, Brian still here, and I think the two of them between them can actually take a vast majority of the credit for, first of all, for hounding, uh, hounding, founding, hacked off, <laughs> better be careful of that, founding hacked off, um, uh, and by doing so, were instrumental uh, in not just the setting up of the Leveson inquiry, but the very broad remit which that inquiry has. Um, so I think they, they deserve plaudits for that. Um, and then we have um, Max. Max Mosley um, 
who uh, first studied physics at Oxford, uh, then qualified as a barrister. Um, got into motor racing while at university. My favorite story about, about Max is that one of his first races, someone saw his name on a list and said, ah, Max Mosley, he must be the son of Alf Mosley, the coach builder. <laughs> and, and at that point, Max said he knew that motor racing was the place to be. Um, uh, I, comp Max competed himself at the F2 level. Uh, I, think, I think competent but not outstanding is probably a, a, a fair way to, to put it. Um, then set up uh, the Con Constructors Association with Bernie Eccleston, became president of the FIA, the governing body, in 93 and was re-elected in 97 and 2001 and in 2005. Uh, in March 2008, um, the News of the World published various allegations about his involvement in uh, various sexual activities, which they said involved Nazi themes. Max successfully sued them for invasion of privacy and has been a uh, forceful and articulate campaigner for uh, reformed press regulation. Max is also um, a core uh, Leveson participant. Um, the only one on the panel. And finally, a uh, very eminent uh, QC barrister, Hugh Tomlinson, founding member of Matrix Chambers, uh, another Oxford graduate from Balliol, um, founded Matrix. Uh, he's a noted specialist in uh, media law, which includes defamation, confidence, privacy. Um, uh, probably most famous for his clients, which include, and you'll tell me if I'm wrong, Hugh, Lily Allen, um, Rio Ferdinand, the Beckhams, Ryan Giggs, Fred Goodwin, and the Prince of Wales. Now, that's a pretty good client list, I think, for anyone. Um, he is known, apparently, as the super injunction specialist, at which point uh, the journalists in the room all go boo hiss, although in John Terry's case, he actually worked for Associated Newspapers, so all the journalists go hooray. Um, in terms of the phone hacking case, he's represented uh, Robert Murat in his defamation case, allegations made in respect of uh, Maddie McCann's disappearance. He's also represented Christopher Jeffries uh, in Bristol, uh, who was essentially stitched up by some of the tabloids for um, the murder of Joe Yeats. Uh, and Sienna Miller, Brian Paddock, uh, Tessa Jow, and a host of others uh, in, in the... Um, uh, phone hacking case. And I should say he also runs the very in influential legal blog called Inform. Uh, that's Inform with a double R in the middle, which is a must read and had a very good party last night, which is why I'm not entirely on the ball this afternoon. Okay, that's the panel. Um, uh, detailed intros. Um, I'm going to give them, as I say, each of them um, no more than eight minutes and hopefully less to outline their plans and then it'll be over to you. Jonathan. Uh, thanks, Steve, and thanks to the University of Westminster and BJR for inviting me and I'd like to pass on Lord Hunt's apologies. He, he would like to have been here, but uh, he has unfortunately got a series of very important meetings today. In terms of the subject we're discussing today, whenever I get nervous about these events at the moment, I just try and remember what it was like a year ago at the same time, and that provides a lot of reassurance to me. There is a serious point to that in that I think now we've got into the nitty-gritty of Leveson and into the real detail. There is a real consensus emerging on lots of different areas. I mean, we'll put it to the test today in, in terms of listening to the contributions and we'll see where we agree and disagree, but I think there, are, there is quite a lot of common ground emerging and there's, there are areas that will still be left to debate, but I think it's been a, a healthy process which um, Chris Patton has described as government by tutorial. <laughs> so, so in terms of what I want to say, I think the lesson from Leveson, and it's an obvious one and it probably was already there from what had happened in terms of phone hacking, was that things just couldn't go on as they were. Everybody, I think, now acknowledges that. That lesson's got to be taken on by the industry, by the public at large, by Lord Justice Leveson, and ultimately by the politicians who are going to have to make the decisions on these matters. But what came out clearly through the evidence was that the PCC had done an effective job in terms of mediation, in terms of conciliation, in terms of complaints, in terms of high satisfaction rates from complaints. So we, thousands of people who were using the service each year. But the, there was a glaring gap in the most serious 
standards and compliance issues. And if you look at what's happened in terms of the evidence to Leveson, that's talking about the Watsons, the Dowlers, phone hacking, the McCann's case, Chris Jeffries, lots of others. And, and I have to acknowledge people like Brian Cathcart and Martin Moore have been pointing this out for some time. So I have to acknowledge that point uh, before I move on to address it. So, Lord Hunt came in with a remit. He was tasked by the uh, newspaper and magazine industry to come in with a blank sheet of paper, to look afresh, decide what worked, what didn't work, to rip up what didn't work, and to construct a new model. And that's what he did. And he pretty quickly concluded that the PCC, in fact, wasn't a regulator at all. He believed that regulation was needed. He was a passionate believer in self-regulation, a passionate believer in freedom of expression. But he said that what was lacking was sufficient investigative and um, teeth, really, power, powers of teeth and enforcement. And so what was needed was to construct a regulator. So his model, in effect, was to design a two-armed system, one which would be based on the existing complaints and mediation service, which is popular with the public, which does satisfy people, but which clearly didn't address these major concerns. And secondly, to build on that with a standards and compliance arm. Now, this would be for the most serious and systemic breakdown in standards. It would have serious investigative powers and the powers to fine. There is the possibility of a third arm, and that's been put forward by Lord Justice Leveson himself, of an arbitral arm. But at this stage, the PCC hasn't expressed a view on that, except to say that the model that's devised by Lord Hunt is sufficiently flexible enough for it to be added on if necessary. So how would this be enforced? How is he going to actually make this work, particularly when, uh, as I'm sure is going to be brought up later, there is such a thing as the Desmond question where Northern and Shell titles withdrew from um, the PCC's version of self-regulation. Lord Hunt's plans for a new system to be legally underpinned through enforceable commercial contracts. And this is where I think I'll differ from the other speakers today. Each publisher will sign a contract with the regulator which will be enforceable through the civil law. This will bind publications into the system and equip the new regulator with powers of enforcement, effectively compelling cooperation with the regulator by enabling it to sue for any contractual breaches. We've argued that the contract should include the following commitments. One, funding the regulator according to an agreed formula. Two, that the publisher should undertake to abide by the code and relevant laws. Three, to maintain an efficient system of internal complaints handling and accepting the jurisdiction of the new body where complaints have not been dealt with satisfactorily. Four, supporting clearly defined compliance and standards mechanisms which could be scrutinised by the regulator. And five, accepting proportionate financial sanctions via the funding formula should serious or systemic systematic breaches be found. So I hope you'll see that this is beginning to provide the teeth that the system requires. In terms of compliance within organisations, there will be a named, dedicated senior executive within each, public, pub, within each publisher who will be tasked with managing internal compliance with the new arrangements and also reporting to the new regulator. They'll have to produce a, a series of annual reports which would then be audited by the new body. So, in essence, it's going to the very basics of self-regulation in that it begins at the actual newspaper and publication itself and it's possibly best dealt, and this was a point the MST have made over the years, it's possibly best dealt with by the newspaper and magazine themselves in, in direct contact with the member of the public. Ultimately, I, I should point out that obviously the future model for regulation of the press is going to be a matter for Lord Justice Leveson himself. There's no question of anybody usurping that. Thank <laughs> you.